I found the more that I would just say yes to stuff like that, I would I would like force myself into it, but I would always figure a way out to like do it. And then I'd post footage and then someone would hear like word of mouth, oh, Patrick's band just played with Paul McCartney's son. Well, we're going to book him for this like music festival. And then from there, I'm going, oh my God, I barely got through that. Now I've got to go figure out this music festival, which I'm sure the other bands who were practicing all the time and that would have been like ecstatic. And I was, but I had no time to like celebrate because I was like too focused on just pulling it off. Welcome to Side Hustle Hero, the show that is laser focused to inspire you to take action to start or to scale your side hustle income streams. I'm your host, Joan Possidy, author of The Way Success Works, How to Decide, Believe and Begin to Live Your Best Life. My guest today has deep reservoirs of courage. He'll say yes to new challenges and then scramble to figure out a way to deliver. Like when he said yes to opening for Paul McCartney's son, his band was hired to do the gig, but there was one problem. At the time, he didn't actually have a band. It was just him, but that didn't stop him. Patrick McWilliams is a full-time contractor and tradesperson, and his side hustle is in performing as a musician, stand-up comedian, and DJ. Regardless of your industry's side hustle, I think you'll be inspired by Patrick's just say yes spirit and perseverance. It's kind of contagious. You'll want to stick around too for the end wrap up where I drill down on the key takeaways of being authentic and saying yes. Yes to new opportunities, to adventure, to your best life. Now here is my conversation with full-time contractor and side hustle performer, Patrick McWilliams. Hey, Pat, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Hey, since your side hustles revolve around performing, mostly music, I want to ask you, how far back does your interest in music go? Has it been part of your world for a long time now? A lot of it started probably around when I was like 16. So that was quite late in terms of starting to be a musician. I guess that would be 11 years now. But when you start, a lot of people, you know, start kind of playing guitar when they're maybe 11 or 12, when they mm -hmm. listen to Green Day or something, you know. Uh, yeah. But I really didn't see, I mean, I didn't see that it could be a career in any form doing art because you put rock stars and actors and stuff on a pedestal. It wasn't really until I was getting towards the end of high school where I would see people graduate that I knew when I was in grade eight and they were in grade 12. And I would see them sign like a record deal and move to London or Los Angeles or something and tour. And I was like, that's all you have to do. You just start a band and then you're going to be famous. I can do that. And of course, I was very naive then. Okay. But, uh, but at least you could see it could happen, right? Yeah, exactly. But seeing people that I knew move away to different cities that started bands or that were trying to be actors, and then I would see them in like a Netflix show or touring with some band, I didn't realize you could have a job that wasn't just, you know, working on cars or building houses. And so when I saw that, it kind of kicked things into overdrive for me where I was like, I don't care if I'm doing music or acting or anything artistic. I just want to do something kind of non-conventional because I'd been in such a sheltered world before that. Tell me about your first performance. Oh, I have to think about that, but I can guarantee it was probably atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> um, was it singing, playing guitar? What were you doing? I think my very first instrument was playing the drums. Because I think I probably just like, everyone wants a drummer. And I think I knew like a couple people that played guitar and like their dad had a drum set or something. And so I, th I think everyone would just throw me on the drums because I wasn't really a musician, but it's easy enough to just count. And okay. everyone wants to be, you know, the front man songwriter guy. I think that's kind of what really got me started. And my aunt, she eventually bought me a drum set, put in the garage, but uh that kind of was what put me on the path to starting to play and join bands and stuff. And then I guess probably my first show would be, I think I loaded like the drum set and stuff into a coffee shop on like an open mic night. Okay. And so everyone's playing like acoustic guitar and then 
I'd show up with my friends with these big amps on like a Tuesday and like blow the roof <laughs> off some like, you know, 10 person coffee shop. It was so fun that I think it's, I guess it's kind of a blessing and curse because I think I had more fun doing that at the time than most of the stuff I get to do now. <laughs> <laughs> so how old yeah. were you in that first coffee shop? Uh, I was probably like 16. Okay. And the people I would be playing with were around like, I guess, anywhere from 13 to like 40. Because sometimes like old blues guitar players from Langley would just come and join on stage and start playing like Bachman Turner Overdrive and stuff like that. Nice. And so it was really like eclectic. <laughs> and I'm like, I think one of the biggest things in at that time that I didn't really know, but that I'm grateful for now is that it didn't really put me in kind of like a limited box the way that bigger cities like Vancouver and Los Angeles. When I go there now, I find that everyone's so influenced by what their like peers are doing. Yes. Whereas for me, when you're playing with a 13 year old or a 50 year old or a 40 year old, you're lucky because you're going from current music that I would be introduced to. Mm -hmm. And then also like really old bands. So sometimes you're playing like 50s rock and roll. And then the next day you're like playing with this like female pop musician that's doing like, you know, Britney Spears covers or something. Right. So but, you get exposed to a lot of different things. Yeah. And you get the experience from seeing what it's like being in both those kind of worlds. But I knew like that, I guess from that point for 11 years now, I've been pretty much doing everything I can to stay in that world and do something creative, like as much as possible. Well, when you first walked into the coffee shop, you were yeah. playing drums. Yeah. What was your kind of progression from there? I kind of got, I was really, I was really excited, like I said, but I wanted to keep growing because I was so intrigued by things. And I found after a while of just drumming for everyone that I wasn't really that passionate about the songs they were playing because okay. a lot of it, a lot of it was friends who they wanted to be in a band in high school and impress the girl. But then <laughs> once they did that, they kind of lost all their ambition and didn't really want to put effort in. Uh. And so I was like, oh, well, if I learned the drums, I can learn guitar and I can learn piano and I can play bass by myself. And so right. I just kind of did. And it was terrible, but it was like I said, it was super fun. And so I did that for a couple of years at home. I still play with people, but I would just go home and sit on this little crappy MacBook that I got from Valley Village and record layers of all the instruments right. and start putting out music under different like band names so that people, I was like, oh man, if they know I'm just doing this by myself, that's going <laughs> to seem really sad. So I was like, uh, I just make these like fictional bands. And from it. there, right? I'm like, yeah. from there, I would start to like take pictures and post artwork that again, wasn't that great. But I like would sell the illusion that there was this like mysterious band. And it was great until I started getting booked for shows. And then I'm like, <laughs> oh. oops. <laughs> some of, some like bigger promoters in the city would be like, hey, do you want to open for like some huge band? Like at one point I got to play with Paul McCartney's son. Nice. And I remember getting that gig being like, oh, man, I am in way above my head. <laughs> well, what did you do? Uh, I, I went on Craigslist and I just found I was like, uh, do you play drums? And this guy's like, yeah. And I got like a ragtag group of guys. And I was like, <laughs> all right, we're playing with Paul McCartney's son tomorrow. So you all have to learn 30 songs and we're going to wing it without practicing. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we would do OK. It was like, I don't know how uh, I've I had to take a lot of Tums with me at the time because I think I had like 10 stomach ulcers from anxiety. Man, that would be but, that would about a huge amount of uh, faith. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Our but, band can do it. OK, right? now I have to create a band. I found the more that I would just say yes to stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I would I would like force myself into it, but I would always figure a way out to like do it. And mm -hmm. then I'd post footage and then someone would hear like word of mouth. Oh, Patrick's band just played with Paul McCartney's son. 
well, we're going to book him for this like music festival. And then from there, I'm going, oh, my God, I barely got through that. Now I've got to go figure out this music festival, which I'm sure the other bands who were practicing all the time and that would have been like ecstatic. And I was, yeah. but yes. I had no time to like celebrate because I was like too focused on just pulling it off. <laughs> the, the exciting thing is, though, you kept saying yes. You didn't wait till everything was perfect and your band was, well, there wasn't a band. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And even even now, there's still technically, I've probably had like 20 or 30 reiterations of that band. Or I, mm -hmm. guess, I guess if that band is the same one that I do now, but it's just changed names and members and all of that over the last like eight years. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I always just wait until... I'll get an email and then it's like back in full force. And then sometimes a month goes by or a week or six months. But with COVID, it was really, it really put a damper on things because yeah. I was living here and living in Los Angeles right up until COVID happened. Oh, and no. I had actually just got my first agent and manager and made like serious connections. And it was pretty much even just doing like gigs every month right it was insane it was it was just surreal and then losing that you're like oh man what am I gonna do now so and you've run into some definite challenges I mean COVID aside I understand at a young age you connected with a uh let's call him a, a less than honest producer oh that's yeah that has happened uh a bit too often I mean it's still ongoing now oh more than um, once yeah I've I've had probably I want to say in the last probably since I guess probably since I was like 16 or 17 from when I had my first job yes I I'd, I'd basically sink every penny that I had into music or like traveling to meet producers and stuff mm -hmm. but again since I was the only one contributing since there was no like band right. I would wear I would wear the burden of all four members and so I would play a show and especially when you're from out of town, they love to kind of prey on that because they know you have no experience and they sell you dreams of grandeur because they're like, Hey kid, you come with me. I'm going to make you a star. Right. We're going to go down to Hollywood Boulevard. And you're like, yeah. And they're like, now normally I charge $10,000 a song, but for you, I'm going to do it for 1000 because I believe in you. And mm. you're like, Oh man, that, yeah, that's awesome. absolutely what a deal. Yeah. And even my parents were like, oh, man. And then you go record this song that sounds like you recorded it through like your toaster. <laughs> and you just think like, for me, as a 17 year old kid, I was, my first job was at Taco Del Mar. But it's like my paycheck was probably a thousand dollars for like four months. Mm. And you sink that in and then you pay and then nothing happens. Right. And the producers are like, oh, well, you know let's do another one. Cause maybe if, if we just do like work, we'll work towards an album. Cause then a record label will buy that even still to this day, I've got, I'm just inundated with people because they, they always start off with the soft sell. They're like, Oh man, I love your music. I'm a fan. I don't want anything from you. And you're like, cool, cool, man. And then you start seeing them at like three of your shows and they're like, yeah. And then finally they're like, you know what? screw it man let's just do a song together and you're like yeah this this guy's my friend he's okay. come to my shows he's a fan yeah and then boom yeah that'll be 10 grand and you're like come on it's still it's still happening now and the funniest thing is everyone who's helped me ever in my life I never had to pay for any of it mm. the people who've done like the real doors that have opened up yes. didn't cost me a penny yeah so yeah that sounds like you need to put together a mastermind team of uh, people in the know in the industry, yeah. one, ones that you can trust. Yeah. A friend of mine many years ago, Ryan, he was in the construction business and he, well, basically lost a lot of money on uh, one contract. And yeah. he said, you know what, though, in retrospect, I'm fine with it because I learned the lesson. Now that I'm involved in these larger deals, it would cost yeah. me like way more for that same mistake. So it sounds like you got your eyes wide open now yeah it definitely i'm like i'm jaded but it's but it's definitely one of those things where i'm glad it happened you know for like 
a couple thousand dollars versus if it was now because I know oh man I guess same kind of thing I know some people and I feel really bad for like I said when I was playing with like some 40 and 50 year olds out here Mm -hmm. I know I know some of them where the same producers get their hooks sank into them but Mm -hmm. they've got way more saved up and access to more money than I did at 16 Right. And some of some of them, they've spent like a hundred and fifty thousand dollars with some of these guys, right. and it just makes me like my stomach flips talking to them because yeah. I'm like, oh my god! And then I see I've seen some of them like a year or two later at the open mics, and they are just ruined. I've been doing a lot of stand up comedy. Okay, and in October. I'm actually going on tour with uh, a group called Kenny vs. Spenny, and they had a very popular show in the 2000s that was on uh, like Comedy Central and CBC and everything. Okay. And they're bringing me, they're playing like theaters and like huge venues, and they're bringing me. And I'm like, again, I'm like, oh man, there's other people that probably, you know, deserve it way more and that are grinding. But all my, I'm like, how do I do comedy when I'm going from writing all these really sad songs to now I'm going to go stand up and talk and make everyone laugh and joke about stuff. It's such a weird, like, contrast. A lot of your uh, written jokes are probably going to be about your experience in the music industry. Yeah. And it's it's funny, I guess, too, like, part of how I started doing that is because I would just tell people, like, oh, man you ever get ripped off by a producer and then every musician I know will like laugh their ass off. So now I'm like, okay, I guess that is funny. But basically my whole standup act is just by the story that I've told you and like about growing up here. And then I just add ha ha at the end of it. And right. everyone's like, Oh my God, that's hilarious. <laughs> I'm like, It's not that funny, man. It's just my life. <laughs> well, my... how did you how did you get into comedy oh, in the first place if you were focused on uh, the music I guess right before COVID I'd done like some of the open mics I've done I just wasn't really in the mood when I would show up to play music everyone looked so like bored and sad mm. and you know like some shows you play there's like seven people before you and most most of them are just like random people at the pub that are just trying to enjoy their night Okay. And I, I could see everyone's face being like, here we go. Another Joe Schmoe's going up there. So I just like leave the guitar and I just go up and be like, man, that last guy sucked. No, I'm kidding. But <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> but I'd go up and be like, oh, man, are we all that depressed? We have to come get drunk here on Tuesday. And then everyone would laugh. <laughs> and I, w- I didn't even have material prepared. I would just be talking about life. Wow. And everyone was laughing like really hard. And then I've just kept some of those stories or when I'm around friends or family, they I'm always like the one that I guess is entertaining people, but I'm mm-hmm. kind of like the jokester of everyone that I know. I would keep stories or tell people and everyone was like, man, everything that you think is normal is not that normal. <laughs> you got to like write some of this down and tell people. <laughs> and like one of my one of my best stand up bits but it's not even a bit. It's just something that happened to me. But okay. one of my one of my friends, we were out and we were on like a double date. And so I let like we came home and I was tired. And me and the girl I was dating at the time went to bed in my room. And he was out talking with this girl in the living room like mm-hmm. all night. So I figured they'll either stay and leave or crash on the couch or something. Right. And so I go to bed. And I wake up and I guess the guy got tired or like had an argument with the girl or something. So he just decided he's going to leave her at my place. And I I get up in in the middle of the night and I'm like, what the heck? (laughs) And, And so I go back to sleep and then I get up again and she's gone. I get up again and I go into my kitchen and this was on the Sunday. Now we've gone out on the Saturday, but on the, on the Friday, I had gone out and bought a ton of groceries and I'm like, since I live by myself, it's awesome because I can leave like leftovers and come home and no roommate has like pilfered through them. (laughs) They're still there. Right. 
And so I'm like, oh man, I, and I get all the like bachelor essentials. I've got bagel bites and hot dogs and that kind of stuff. But I just packed my whole house because I just got paid. Okay. And I wake up and I notice first the reusable like fabric grocery bags that I have. Mm -hmm. I keep on on my counter. They were missing. And I was like, okay, that's kind of weird. And then I open my fridge and I'm like, oh my God, there's just sections that looked like Tetris of things that were missing. And so I'm opening up my cabinets and this girl had literally gone through my house and stolen like a brand new thing of ketchup, like boxes of pizza pops, like a brand new loaf of bread. Like she literally went, she went grocery shopping in my house, (sighs) but she was taking like, I had a brand new pepper grinder full of pepper, took it. I'm like, what? Really? And so I'm I'm going through and I'm so mad at first because I'm up and I'm tired. I'm like, I'm going to make coffee. And I go and my ground like espresso grinds are missing. So I couldn't even make an Amer- like an espresso. Right. I'm going, what? <sighs> and so I'm like, oh, my God. And that one always like kills. I don't <laughs> explain it that way, but I'm like, but none of that is Aww. edited at all. I yeah. just got up. I'm like, who steals groceries? Really? I couldn't believe it. Wow. So it was insane. Wow. Just mind blowing. So yeah, that's that was kind of a long winded answer to what got me into comedy. <laughs> Cause I'm like, I have I have to start telling people what life is like in some of these places that I go. Mm-hmm. What do you think you get most fulfillment of? The comedy or music? I really like talking if you haven't noticed. So I definitely <laughs> enjoy comedy in that aspect. I feel like it's easier to be honest through the music because you can hide behind a lot of like the guitar and that kind of thing. And you can mm-hmm. you can be more, I guess, metaphorical in a song. You don't have to be as direct. Whereas in comedy, you can't really make metaphors at all. You have to be like very blunt. Right. So I would say I enjoy music more in like a sincerity thing. But I enjoy comedy because it's I love I like I know how much it means to me when I'm feeling down and someone makes me laugh or even just makes me feel like not alone for a bit. Yes. And I have a really hard time with that. So I don't know. I think I get more fulfillment out of music, but I get I get an equal amount of fulfillment from like seeing people laugh at that because I know it's not necessarily making me happy, but. I'm glad knowing that I'm like for an hour or however long that I'm making their day. If mm-hmm. they, you know, maybe they got bad news or whatever, so they can come laugh for a bit. That that makes me feel pretty good. Yeah, I seem to recall reading somewhere that um, you did go through a difficult period. There was a bunch of um, debt, and that caused you to to focus more on, I guess, what is now your full time work. Yeah, my full time work was born around the same time with COVID. My dad had lost his job that he had had for like years and years. And he was kind of in a slump too, where he's trying to figure out because I think he's, he was like 57 at the time. And so it's kind of hard to pivot as it was for everyone during COVID to pivot from, you know, I've had X job for so many years and now I'm getting laid off and there's no job to go back to because every company's had to like downsize. And so my dad met with my family and me, him and my mom are separated, but we still are like very close. Mm -hmm. And so he'd been asking like, what should I do? This is the first time in my life. I don't have a plan. He's like very, he was running like a very huge uh, audio visual company that was like all across Canada. Mm. And so he was always traveling growing up. I would like see him and he was, in like meetings all day and now he's gone from that to nothing and so but he's very very handy and he's got like he knows how to do plumbing and electrical and sound and all that kind of stuff and so my mom had said well we've got some stuff around our building so you could come help out in the meantime so he would do like some drywall and some painting and that started snowballing to where like the property managers would ask him to come to one of the other buildings that they manage. Okay. And then he started to need more help. And so he would bring me with him 
because it's COVID, I'm not doing much. And fast forward over the last kind of three-ish years, now we work for like 50 to something different buildings and do all kinds of everything from like home renovations to building maintenance and all that. So it's like super, super crazy. Again, probably the furthest thing from being an uh, artistic person, but very fulfilling. I was a mechanic before, like after high school. I did that for like six years, I think. Okay. But that was all I really knew how to do. Anything in the performance aspect, whether it's music, as a comedy, uh, DJing, that's always been a side hustle for you. Is that the case? Yeah. It's been, at some points, it was on the verge of becoming a full-time thing. Sure. But always, always kind of on the side. But it's nice. Like now, I'm doing comedy and DJing and music still. And it's more of like a supplementary income thing. Yes. Or, but also just a passion project too. Mm-hmm. So, so you still want to promote or get your music out there. Is that yeah. correct? I'm still doing like, I'm just, it's so hard because I'm doing all three. Okay. But I'm like trying to balance this life where sometimes I get like show things where they're like the DJ stuff. I had no idea how to DJ. Okay. But people would message me on Instagram and say, we'll give you $500 to come DJ this bar for an hour. I'm like, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> and so I just figured it out kind of on like a YouTube thing. Right. And I've been doing that, making decent money. And then someone will say, oh, you're kind of funny. Come open for me at this comedy club and we'll give you a 400 bucks. And I'm like, Okay, I'll, well, I'm now I'm going to figure out how to do that. <laughs> so like, I love well. Two things: number one, you put yourself out there in the first place for somebody to hear you to say, "Hey, you're funny. Come do this for us." Yeah. And secondly, even without having it all figured out, you're going, "Sure, yes, I could yeah. do that." And then it's like, right? "Oh my god, what did I just do?" <laughs> that's I'm like I I spent so much time saying no or overthinking, and that's part of anxiety. Mm-hmm. So I'm, after COVID, I think was the biggest push where I'm like, I'm just going to say yes to things first and then figure it out after. Right. That's fantastic. So I, I view it like I'm just as grateful working with my dad. It almost doesn't feel like either or is the side hustle. I just feel lucky that I get to do both. Like I would, if I, if I blew up with music or comedy or anything like that, I'd definitely be sad because I get to see my dad every day and stuff. And so, you know, but I I would be sad too if I worked with my dad forever and didn't get to experience music. So Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. It's the it's the tortured internal conflict that every artist has. We're so indecisive. Maybe that's one of the reasons you took on three things, not just music, but music and comedy and DJing. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Even even here it's funny my front door of my apartment is like all kind of newspapers and different articles and stuff that I've been in. And some days I, some days I walk by it and I'm super grateful and I'm like, yes, I accomplished all this stuff. Yes. And some days, some days I walk by it and I'm like, Oh my God, this stuff's all public. I, I want to hide and pull my blackout curtains over and sit with my cat. But because you've made it public, people are learning from you. That's true. I was really, I was really glad when you'd said that you liked the, that first story that I did uh, in the newspaper when I talked, because I know a lot of people that felt like in high school, you know, they were trying bands and, and all that kind of stuff. Cause I went to a fine arts school mm-hmm. and just like me at my school, I actually went and auditioned there to be in music and I got accepted and it was like a really cutthroat thing. But when I got there, the like students and the teacher just ridiculed me and they were all because you start that school when you're in kindergarten okay. or grade one so everyone's like a child prodigy by the time they're like you know 13 mm-hmm. and can read music and all that and I came from like a public school in Surrey with right. almost no experience which I thought you know isn't that the point of school so that you're going to learn for sure but, and uh, how, how old were you at the time when you went uh, to the school I was 15. I, I went there okay. in grade 10. All right. And I get there and just get laughed out of music. So 
I ended up having to switch what I was going for. And I ended up going into creative writing, mm. which at the time I was like, oh man, I've, I left my old school so I could learn music. Now I'm in this school, I'm stuck and I got to do creative writing. Right. I don't want to be an author, but that was like probably one of the biggest like life-changing moments looking back because my teacher was so accepting and so like she was so out of the box the way that she thought but so accepting right and she knew how bad I wanted to do music so she let me do almost all my projects as like I could do it as a song or I could do it however I wanted Mm. and she she ended up actually here's the ironic part she opened a recording studio in our high school and not even the music department did that the creative writing teacher did so I'm like (laughs) she she was like just god's gift to mankind at that point and she really helped me through like we were pretty close Mm -hmm. going through school so she was awesome but in hindsight i'm looking at that going it helped me write lyrics it helped me phrase jokes it helped Mm. me with doing like job interviews and have good like diction and know how to converse with people so that was that was like probably one of the biggest blessings that i've had in life fantastic and that, that that's such a perfect example of when something happens and in the moment we judge it to be terrible often what the hell's yeah. going on here i came here for music yeah but then in retrospect like you just said it's a, ended up to be a, a terrific experience for all those reasons yeah which i would say almost everything in my life that i hadn't planned for mm-hmm. like i'd said with music and comedy and that but everything i've never planned for has ended up being the biggest blessing and mm-hmm. all the things that I've thought, I've put so much effort or said, it has to be this. I can't, I can't stray off this path has right. been looking back. And I'm like, why did that matter so much? Mm. So, yeah, it's just the way it goes. Yeah. And I find it's also the, the, the key is keeping focused on that sort of end picture because we think we may know the path to get there, but maybe there's a a better more fun way yeah and it ta- looks like it's taking us off off course but if we just stick with it eventually we'll get there maybe in a, a much more fun way than we could have even imagined exactly you're like completely right on the the biggest thing is focusing on that end picture and that's what's got me into almost all of these situations and it's just all about whatever's going to bring me happiness i've never really thought about the external things like if someone else is gonna like the song or Mm -hmm. if they're influencing my jokes I'm like what what kind of jokes do I want to go on stage and tell or not even just a joke but I'm like what am I able to Mm because I maybe it's good that I never really learned you know comedy or music the same way as anyone else because I only know how to do it the way that I can right so and and if you're being asked to get up on stage to do it obviously you're doing something right right yeah i'm like i i don't know but i don't at this point i'm like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna change something like i'm not gonna fix what isn't broken right so Mm -hmm. i'm like i'm I'm just gonna take it that i'm pretty much i can't remember if it was either a girl told me this and i'm i think she might have just been saying it as like a drunk bar thing and maybe she didn't mean it that sincerely but it stuck with me and it's like kind of universal but she was saying you're the only patrick so it doesn't matter what anyone else does cuz even if i like cover a song i'm the only patrick that could cover someone else's song i can only do it my way i'm the only patrick that could write a song the way that i do and so i'm like that i don't know why it stuck with me and was so heavy and she probably didn't mean it that way, but I'm like, that gives me so much peace of mind. Cause I'm like, yeah, I guess that is true. Like either I'll play an arena one day or I'll play small venues, but I can't do anything about that. And in like a songwriting aspect, because I can only write the songs that I can. Yeah. And no one can do it like Patrick. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's next for Patrick McWilliams? I've been DJing all summer actually and I've got some shows that I'm doing uh this week and then next week I'm going to be doing like three or four comedy shows in Calgary nice and then um I'm going to come back 
And then in October, I've got my stand-up tour with Kenny and Spenny, which that is just so surreal because that was, they were probably like my biggest comedy influences when I was growing up. So a big full circle moment nice. uh, with that. Yeah. And then hopefully I can squeak in one day playing another concert, but we'll see the probably I'll probably do some shows in November and December, but right now I'm just kind of going with the flow. No, that sounds terrific, Patrick. What's the best way for listeners to connect with you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram. Pretty much if you, oh, this is so contrived, but I'm grateful. But <laughs> if you if you Google Patrick McWilliams, there's, okay, well, I shouldn't say that. If you Google Patrick McWilliams, the first chunk of things are me. But there's also some very, there's I guess there's a criminal in like Ireland or the UK or something that's also named Patrick McWilliams. Oh, so no. yeah, I and those articles, all my news articles come up, but then it'll also say like convicted murderer Patrick McWilliams goes to UK jail for 25 years. That is not me. You're so sure that's not you. <laughs> <laughs> I get people I get people like tagging me and stuff and I'm like that's the wrong Patrick, wrong Patrick. <laughs> I got to put the links in the, in the show notes so people can just click through. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. There is a huge demand right now for contractors, for tradespeople. It would be pretty easy for you to spend all your time focused on developing that. Maybe even, you know, you and or you and your dad starting your own company. But clearly performing is in your blood, whether that's as a musician, stand-up comedy, DJ, and all through it. I mean, obviously there's been some highs, but there's been some lows, some challenges, and you've shown perseverance. So what's your best ad advice, a tip strategy to help others do the same with their side hustle? I think whether it's even with main hustle or side hustle, I think in this, I've learned this somehow even more during the, the conversation but being authentic and doing something that you love, whether it's your day job or your passion, if you're truly authentic and you do love it, then it's never going to feel like you're doing work. And, you know, some people, it takes them a long time to find out what that is, but you don't gotta, you know, some people don't find out until you're 50. So just don't mm -hmm. stress out, man. You just gotta go with the flow. And, you know, someday, like me finding all this stuff out, it'll just hit you in the face and you'll go, Oh my God, I've never felt this happy before. And, or that, or just buy a cat. <laughs> <laughs> there you the... go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all I got. Yeah. Well, I so look forward to following your career, Patrick. And I thank you for sharing your inspiring story of resilience, perseverance, um, the, the diversity that you have in your side hustles and ability to try different things. That's so cool. And uh, I thank you for being today's side hustle hero. Right on. Thank you so much. This is an awesome conversation. Patrick mentioned that he was fortunate enough to meet a woman who pointed out to him there's only one Patrick McWilliams. Similarly, you have a very unique combination of skills, talents, and passions that allow you to provide a product or service that is unique to you. No one else can do it quite like you can. Those of you who have studied with me for years know that I worked with Bob Proctor early on in my career, and he's someone who is world-renowned in the field of personal development. And I remember talking to him one day about feeling like I was reciting some of his material almost verbatim when someone asked me a question. And it wasn't because I was trying to plagiarize him. It was just that I had studied so much and I taught what was then his flagship program for a number of years that his material was ingrained in my psyche and it just couldn't help but come out. He assured me that since it was coming through me, it would be unique to me. And that's the message I want to share with you. You have a unique combination of skills, talents, interests, and experiences that no one else has. Take all that wisdom and knowledge that you've gained and use it to share your gifts with the world. Be yourself, but be your very best self. 
Secondly, I really appreciate Patrick's ability to jump in and say yes, even when everything is not in place. For example, when he was asked if his band would open for James McCartney, Paul McCartney's son, at that moment, the band was him. Despite that, he said yes, and then started figuring out how to do it. In his case, he turned to Craigslist for band members. Too often, we want everything guaranteed in place before we act. But if we insist on that all the time, we'll miss out on some really sweet opportunities in life. My advice, listen to your intuition, your gut. If you're feeling a strong drive to say yes, then for God's sake, say yes. Either it'll be a fabulous success or you'll have a learning experience. Treat every situation in life as that. It's either a success or a learning experience. If it's a success, great. Celebrate, pop the champagne. If it's a learning experience, consider what did you learn so that in the future you would do things differently? That way your confidence will grow as you'll be that much better prepared to face future challenges. Well, that's a wrap. You'll find the show notes and links for Patrick's Instagram, which will lead you to his music and comedy on our website, sidehustleheropodcast.com. And I'd love to hear your feedback on the show, on the guests, how this podcast is helping you, what areas could we do better? Shoot me an email message to hello at joanpossevy.com or by DM on Instagram at joanpossevy. Thanks for listening and hustle on.